So, hello everyone. Um, nice to see a full room. Um, yes, uh, let's talk about a bad ghoul. Um, this presentation is uh, the making, it's about the making of the VFX of the short film A Calling from the Desert to the Sea. And let me just give you a quick overview of what this project is um, so that you know what we're talking about before we actually start. Um, it was a diploma project at Animationsinstitut and in cooperation with Film Academy. Film Academy was responsible for the live action part of it and Animationsinstitut, we did the VFX for it. And in the VFX department there were over 30 people uh, working on this, uh, not at the same time, so that was spread over a course of uh, three years roughly. And at the same time it was always like 10 to 15 people working on there. Um, yes, but now uh, let me introduce us. Um, I'll start at the very left. Um, there we have Till, our creature lead, and uh, he will talk about uh, he will talk about the the creation process of of the monster and the animation. Then, um, well, I'll just continue with uh, Lucas. Our compositing lead, um, he will talk about, of course, compositing and um, the, the, the shot production and matte paintings. Then we have our other Lucas, uh, our rigging TD. He will uh, speak, of course, about uh, the rigging and also about the muscle and fat simulations. Then we have Mario, our supervisor. He will talk about the overall VFX scope and the um, initial idea how, how this pro project was initiated. And I'm Leonard, I am uh, one of two VFX producers, and I will talk a little bit about timelines and communication uh, with such a big team. Uh, and at the end, I will also speak a little bit about the breakdown um, that we will show you now. Have fun. So yeah, this uh, was the actual VFX breakdown of, uh, or it was part of like the short movie, A Calling from the Desert to the Sea, like Leonard al already told us. Um, and I want to just talk about a little bit about the initial idea we started all of this, or how we all started this. Like it was about like four years ago, uh, we got really excited about like doing a creature, like a photorealistic creature, and uh, we we thought about, yeah, maybe just doing a creature is a bit like boring. We also want to tell a story. So um, we sit together and uh, at first we wrote different storylines. Um, most of the time we ended up with a kind of alien human relationship at the beginning. And uh, together with our director, uh, we had a lot of sessions. And at the end, we came up with two little girls living in a desert with uh, their father. And uh, the father tells her, 
tells them like the story all the time, like there's a creature living in a desert and the girls were scared about leaving their home. That's the main, main storyline. Um, and uh, our general approach about this project was also the VFX should serve the story and uh, we want to achieve highest quality possible. So, and because we had a lot of like experience in projects, like the, the scope was ex exceeded like all the time, we limited ourselves to have like a maximum of 10 shots. So this was our goal. And uh, we, for us, it was really important to have like at the end enough time to polish all the shots. So this was our general approach. Um, at the end, we finished this uh, project with eight creature shots, seven integrated into live action plate, and one full CG one. It's the right, right top corner one. Um, we also had 11 matte painting shots, mainly extending mountains, um, adding the city skyline at the end, and also one full CG matte painting shot. And because no movie, movie um, works works without cleanups. Uh, we, are, we had also a few, um, few of them as well, like removing tracks, uh, cables, reflections, and a fly, which was unwanted in, in some specific shots. So, yeah. Yes, um, so now you've seen the scope um, of the project. And uh, to put it in perspective, we before we started into shot production, this was our timeline. Uh, that was, uh, we, we did it in November 20. One, and the the shop production started in the middle of January 2022 um, until um, June uh, six, uh, 15th, and you see there are a lot of processes uh, um, going on at the same time. Um, we uh, every every process took a little bit longer, except for compositing. Actually, thanks to Lucas, so we actually uh, stuck to a stuck to the deadline. So delivery was on the day it was supposed to be. Um, but yeah, so um, there are a lot of people working at the same time always, and things go back and for forth. So we uh, had to do a lot of communicating who um, um, about w what things go to whom, when, and if things get changed, who needs to know everything. So we came up uh, with this communication diagram. So um, here on the yellow part on the left, you see uh, the VFX team, pretty straightforward. Um, the artists talk to the leads. And on the right side, you see main production. In the middle, we have uh, us, the VFX heads, um, Max, the other producer, Mario and myself. And for example, um, these lines are not who you are only allowed to talk to, but everyone who needs who is on the line, if you, let's say Murat, our director, wants to talk to Till, the creature lead. They can speak with each other, but then they need to uh, inform also Marlin, our main producer, um, and Max, Mario, and I, so that we all know what's going on and we can adapt uh, to what has uh, been decided. And uh, it actually worked quite well. So we sent this out to everyone uh, in main production, everyone on this, uh, on this uh, diagram got it. And, and in the end, it worked out quite well that uh, everyone was kept in the loop. Yeah. So, does it work? Um, yeah, I will talk about the creature part. Ah, okay, nice. No. Uh, yeah, so uh, we started the creature concept phase back in 2019. Uh, uh, simultaneously with the story development. So it was kind of a ping pong between Murat, our director, and us creating this kind of creature. And the first thing we did, or I did in this case, if this one works. Ah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, creating a creature library. So getting all, uh, most of the creatures that went on the big screen together to get an additional idea what is there, uh, what got successful and so on. So we had a lot of Star Wars, Godzilla, uh, Love, Death and Robots, for example. Um, yeah, so this was pretty helpful. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see our first mood boards here um, on the, for you on the left. Uh, we have the, some animals from the desert because we already knew, okay, our story will be uh, 
playing in a desert environment, so we were searching for some animals that are living there. And on the right, you can see um, some fictional creatures we particularly liked. Um, so yeah, and the first thing what we did then, uh, I worked together with Ihab Alazam, who did the concept, uh, and we started with some rough sketches and uh, to get iterations and then. Um, a lot of outcome. We just took three different animals, put them together, and Iab was doing some rough sketches on top uh, and just combining these animals. And that was uh, leading to a pretty quick um, yeah, outcome. And we could dis uh, go with Murat, and uh, he, we could talk about it and say, OK, this one works good, this not, and so on. And then we also went into some more silhouette working. And um, here you can see uh, that we have different shapes. OK, what is working? In the beginning of the story, we had a lot of dust in there, so shapes were very important. Uh, but then we decided for the five and the eight here. So it's more of an alien uh, looking shape. And from this silhouettes, we continue to work on um, more kind of uh, sketches where you can see here with uh, heads and tails and so on uh, based on the silhouettes. So and we were like happy without the lower ones, like for, for example, the 7.3 and wanted to go further with this. So um, the next step was to get an idea what do we want uh, for the skin, for example. So um, we did uh, more of a scaly way because, of course, a lot of lizards uh, living in the desert as well. And I'm also a big dinosaur fan, so that was also a reason I wanted to do some scales in CG. And uh, yeah, this was like a first draft, getting together everything and then doing some first concept sculpts um, with the uh, uh, additional silhouette, uh, painting and some scaling you can see here. Uh, so to get an idea how big the creature will be. And um, we wanted that it's not too powerful, so it couldn't kill the girls like with one smash, basically. And uh, that's why we didn't make it too big. And yeah, from there, we also continued in 2D, creating different heads, different uh, legs, tails, and so on, because we were happy with the general shape of the body. Um, yeah, and also, we were happy with that. We wanted to continue uh, with the realism, of course, and for that you need um, skeleton and muscles and so on. So the first thing was to do a photo bash of some different animal skeletons. So uh, the upper body is mainly human and lion. Um, then in the back, the rear leg is from an ostrich and the tail and so on we in the end used from uh, Allosaurus. Uh, yeah, when you go on the next one, you can see the 3D sketch um, here with the uh, finished skeleton in ZBrush and just some first skin applied on top. Uh, and then in the meantime, we did some colors and we re really wanted to go on this kind of sandy feel um, and we really liked the one on the right here. So uh, we went further with this and did a first photo bash on it to get an idea with the what kind of textures are on top and how will it look in this kind of environment we wanted. Um, yeah, and this was the first proof of concept we went along with, and Mario will now continue. Yes. Um, from there on, so we got this concept, but um, at this point we didn't know if we will be able to produce such a futuristic creature at this moment. So we decided to, to go on and uh, did some research project. Um, in this case, we tried to rebuild Drogon from scratch. And uh, we, I also want to thank you at this point to Animation Institute because, because they made it possible to have Sven Martin and, and his Pixamondo team for weekly men mentoring sessions. So in this time frame, we, got, we learned a lot and uh, we, we tweaked all of this. And yeah, uh, there were a lot of uh, little things we we could use for our upcoming project. Um, we also tried different techniques, like the LED wall, because at this point we plan to have like this dizzy or dusty environment in the desert. And uh, it kind of makes sense to maybe use such an LED wall, but at the end we decided to not use it 
because there were too much limitations for us. Um, for example, like we also had to shift all the production time in front of the shooting, um, and that was at this point not not possible anymore. And also, like a creature showing on the LED wall is also a really difficult part to have it in real time, and and so on. So. Um, what we did instead also was to, was a kind of visual experience. Um, this was also super helpful for our director and our cast. We um, we built up like the whole desert environment and also the creature. Um, and now you can see a little like uh, frame or like a video out of it, like how our director like um, reacted to this one because he didn't know anything before. Um, but in this, like you can really get an visual experience how this creature feels if it's standing in front of you. Hey guys, I told you I'm not into horror. <laughs> This was really helpful to not have it just in 2D, also experience it in 3D. Um, so, and uh, from there on, um, thanks to our production, we decided to shoot uh, in Jordan or in a real desert because it even makes more sense for our project. So, we did uh, kind of location scouting, we did a lot of scans, we used a drone for this one. Um, and all the scans we used later on. We also printed this mask, like we have it over here. <laughs> uh, we um, built up like the whole environment in Unreal um, and uh, had like, for previous, we used it like to get additional um, framings and all the stuff we used later on. Um, during the previous, um, Previous, uh, yeah, during the previous, we also used mo motion capture for blocking all the characters you can see over here, and also um, used Unreal for get additional like shots we can just test before the shoot. So this was really helpful to have the whole environment like um, before shooting to get into like uh, virtually. So um, during the shoot, this was like a map from the shoot. We had like three shooting locations. They all look <laughs> kind of the same, but they were in there. So um, we were actually collecting a lot of data. We printed this 3D mask as well for like a reference plate for lighting later on. Um, we a also aimed to have an ostrich leg uh, on set, but this wasn't possible uh, or hard to find. Uh, we got like a chicken leg instead, but no worries, we asked a butcher nearby, so this was a kind of leftover. Um, and uh, all of the stuffs w were like really helpful for later on. Uh, this chicken legs, for example, like uh, we can see the bending joints and interacting with the sand. Um, we also threw a tire down the hill uh, to get this kind of reference for our rundown later on. Um, we, I would say, we pretty, uh, pretty close. We matched pretty close. I would say. Um, also, the, it happened like there w was a sandstorm like during the shoot, so we had to leave for a few hours. And uh, I just remember we were dancing like to, to overplay <laughs> this uh, time we were losing at this moment. Um, and after shooting, we. Um, helped like the editing process with kind of really rough animations to visualize like the movement of the creature and uh, also getting a feeling of timing. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, so I will continue actually with the creature process because since we had the final uh, concept we were going into more depth in the 3D so uh, we started with the retopology of our concept sculpts uh, matching the concept of course and also doing the UVs so we ended up with 46 UDIMs all in 4K except the face we did an 8K uh, to get ensure that our DOP can do every shot possible with it basically and then uh, we started texturing and uh, here we used different animals um, 
to put this sandy feeling on it, of course, and also uh, checking if the resolution will uh, hold up uh, in close-ups and so on. Uh, so we try to match as closely as possible the concept. So on the side you see the 2D, the photo bash, and here's the first render uh, of the creature and like checking are the proportions fine and so on. Uh, and so we continued with LookDev uh, working uh, on the whole creature in an, on the right environment. And then we brought all together, did a first walk cycle, uh, simulations, lighting and so on. So this one was basically the first time we saw everything together. And then at this point we realized something <laughs> doesn't look so good. <laughs> So uh, we kind of feel that it was too apish and the head was a little bit like a not matching to the rest of the body. So yeah, we had to go back to 2D and did some more demish, human-like uh, concepts, especially for the face and the head. And we decided for the one in the lower uh, left and uh, went with the body you can see here. So we had to uh, address that to the model, of course, in ZBrush. Um, the good thing was uh, we could use most of the retopo except the face. We had to do this uh, one again, but so we could keep also the UVs and do pretty quick go back into LookDev uh, and see some textures applied on top. Thanks. Um, yeah, here you can see some close-ups. And then we could start with grooming uh, because we wanted to have some kind of hair for him that's not that he's not so naked. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we put the tear, had some first uh, drafts and con continue on that. And here you can see some details um, to ensure that we can kind of match the detail. Kind of proud of the teeth, what we get there. They're, um, yeah, like, of course, a bit destroyed and uh, checking with the references on the sides. And then we did uh, the look final look dev in the proper HDRIs we shot on set. So here you can see the different one. And we did, of course, for every possible um, close-up, so especially for the face here, and also for the limbs and tail and so on. Uh, so yeah, we were pretty happy with it and uh, had a nice displacement coming from Mari and ZBrush bringing everything together in Arnold, in Houdini, and then did some first uh, displacement wedges, uh, just to ensure how is in which strength of the displacement is the creature work the best. And we actually did this in every shot in the end, uh, because when the creature is further away, it's better to have a, a stronger displacement. Um, you will have nicer breakups in your specular and so on. Uh, and of course, in the close-up, we will go lower with the displacement. So we always did some wedges like this and could pick a frame and then we uh, were going with this uh, value. Yeah, now you can see the final thing. And then we did some final renderings with the cool pose. Uh, scanned environment, uh, proper HDRI on set, and this was basically the proof of concept for the finished model. Here you can see some close-ups. We also did some drool there, and this one is then the final image. You can also see it on the flyer that are laying around, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, because I also had to do the animation, <laughs> because it's still a student project, but uh, I really love it. So I started doing some quadruped walk cycles uh, and we quickly realized that our back legs are way longer than our front legs. So um, that's kind of difficult. <laughs> and then we continued uh, by studying more animals like uh, leopards and uh, checking their motion also in running and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, translated that on the creature. Mm, further then, we also tried uh, different walk cycles also on two legs because it could be possible too. And in the end, we ended up uh, combining both of them. So he will walk on four mainly, but he could also stand up if necessary. And with this R&D, we went into the shots, um, working together uh, with four animators and uh, bringing the nine edge shots of the creature to life and developing the 
character there further. So this was pretty intense and we had great mentoring from um, Michael Erni uh, from VETA and uh, that was pretty helpful to get at this stage of the animation. That's it. Uh, <laughs> all right, about the working process. Um, it started quite early in the um, process itself, uh, already in the concept phase as you already saw. Um, to research the locomotion and also make changes to it. Um, so, as you already saw it, so um, initially the wig was created by hand, um, so manually, but we were, well, it was pretty clear that uh, this wasn't the route to follow. Um, so, we decided to do a more flexible solution and I built this modular auto wigging tool. Um, so, basically, the whole wig is scripted in Python. Um, which meant that we could rebuild it at any time quite easily and also that we can adjust it quite easily and um, that changes weren't really a problem anymore. Um, a little bit about the structure. Um, so I divided every um, wig into different modules or wig parts. So the leg, um, the arms, the spine, it's all one little module and it works on its own like a black box. It only gets the incoming connection, do something and then something goes out again. And um, there are some common features that are shared among all the modules. So if you update one thing, everything else gets updated as well. Um, scripting control shapes is always a little bit of a tricky part. So I decided to um, do a more like a template approach. So I um, created the final control, control shapes, then um, save them as a JSON and load them when I'm finalizing the wig. Um, and in the end, we got this wick here, you, as you can see, um, in the finalized um, module or part, um, all modules are getting connected and um, also some settings um, are adjusted um, on the master control. In Maya itself, it then looks like this. It's basically just a bunch of button pressing. Um, it's not really much going on in Maya there, but the whole magic is happening um, behind in Python. Um, exactly. Um, about the body wick, um, it's more or less, I would say, pretty standard um, biped quadruped rig, so meaning you have like FK, IK, space which is soft IK, and so on. Um, the really special part about it was the upper limbs, um, which were human, but were also used um, as a quadruped, so he was working on all four legs, um, which meant that we needed a more flexible solution because you rig bipedal characters differently than quadruped, quadruped characters. So I built in a quadruped biped switch, so it's basically both of those wigs um, combined in one and you got a switch where you can just um, switch the mode. Um, we also had a script that uh, would match it, um, so the animator could start with one um, mode and then just use the script and um, it automatically transferred the whole um, shape into the other one, which made it really flexible since the animator could use what best is for the shot. Um, since we also wanted to do a muzzle simulation, you also need to rig the skeleton as well. And here it's really important to also pay attention to the anatomical features of a skeleton. So for example, as you can he see here, the um, patella sliding between the femur and the tibia, um, or the scapula sliding um, of the, uh, over the rib cage. Also the radius ulnar twist in the forearm, and of course the uh, um, extending of the rib cage when breathing. Um, the face wig itself, it's a fax-based blend shape system, um, but we didn't really use a lot of those um, action units or shapes since um, the creature has mainly one expression, which is angry, so it doesn't really do, <laughs> do a lot of, of face motion, um, so we, we don't really need a lot of those um, different action units. Um, for the mouth itself, uh, we d used, um, we went with the joint-based ribbon system, um, to have more flexibility um, when doing um, the mouth shape. Um, you can also see this um, wireframe mesh here, um, which were used for the rivets. Um, this is vital because um, then Maya stays in parallel, so on the GPU, so the whole wig will be faster. Um, if you didn't do it, then it will be a, lit a lot slower, and the performance will decrease when animating, and this is not really a, a nice thing for the animators. Um, the eyes are always a really special part. Um, you need to get it right. So um, to make it more believable, we added the flashy eye system. It's uh, basically a shrink wrap that um, pushes the eyelid on the eyeball itself, and then it follows along. So it's mainly sliding over it. 
Um, but when you do it, as you can see here, the mesh gets deformed, so we add um, a blend shape on top of it to um, get back this lost data. Um, exactly. So for the muscle simulation, um, we use Ziva VFX. It's a Maya plugin um, made for tissue simulation, mainly um, muscle simulation. Um, we simulated 83 individual muscles, which were all modeled by Till, um, as you saw before. So those were polygons. Um, those aren't created in Ziva or something. Um, normally, muscle simulation is a two-step process. So you first simulate the muscles, cash them out, and use them as a collider in a fat simulation. But we didn't do that. Um, we actually coupled the whole simulation. So um, we did the muscle and fat simulation in one pass. This this meant that the um, fat could react to the muscles and vice versa, which um, will get you better deformation and also you have like less collision errors. Um, but it's way harder to maintain since you always, or to tweak, since you always need to have the fat as well in the simulation, which will also increase the um, simulation time. A little bit about the um, workflow of creating such muscle simulation. Um, first, you would attach all muscles to the bones with like fixed attachment. Um, those are the red ones you are seeing here. Um, and you would use a mix of sliding and fixed constraints um, to shape the muscles during the simulation. Um, the blue or purple ones are the ones that are sliding. Um, then you would add uh, fibers to it. Um, you can see the direction of the fiber as those dotted lines. Um, this is an automatic process, so Ziva is creating those for you, but uh, so, so, those do actions, but um, you sometimes need to adjust those. Um, to match the um, fiber uh, shape of, of the according muscles. Since um, doing contraction, it's, um, those, this, this is the direction where the um, contraction will happen, so where the muscle will bulge, so it's really important to have this right. Um, and then lastly, um, you would add different materials to um, shape those muscles again during simulation. Um, for example, make it stiffer, so it has a different jiggle or um, make it softer so that it jiggles more and so on. Also, as you can see on the triceps, um, we added the tendon material since tendons are um, generally stiffer than the muscle, so it preserves more the shape in it. The contraction of the um, muscles are happening automatically. Um, we are using this curve system here, so it's basically just a bunch of curves, um, more or less one curve for each muscle, um, and it's attached to the um, skeleton. Um, and if the curve shortens, then the muscle contracts, as you can see here. Um, so if the muscle is yellow, then it is uh, activated, it's triggered, it's bulged. And if it's red, then it's in its rest shape. Um, for the fat simulation, we first need to create the fat tissue itself. Um, for that, we used the um, model from the creature itself and adjusted a little bit the topology to have like it more spread out. Also, um, closed or holes, that's why you, you see that the um, head, for example, the mouth is completely filled since you need the watertight mesh. Um, then we would shrink web it to the um, anatomy, so the muscles and the bones, so basically you push everything to it. It's with, with a lot of pressure. Um, this is, would be then the inner layer, or you would also call it fascia, um, and you combine those two, and this is your um, fat layer. Um, the fat itself has different thicknesses, um, or level of thicknesses, um, which will also give you different results in the fat simulation itself. Um, and here you can see the um, final fat simulation on the left. It's the inner fat, um, which is like sticking to the anatomy and also sliding over it. And on the right, you have like the outer fat layer. Um, you know, the head and the um, um, feet and uh, um, Hands are a little bit weird, um, but there we get um, you will get those from from animation in a second. Um, the animated skeleton is is coming from the animator itself. So um, basically, the the whole shot production thing in Ziva is then that you get the animation, the animated skeleton from from your shot, so from the wig, it, um, attach those muscles, and then just simulate it. Um, and here you can see the difference between the animation and the um, simulation. It's it's not like completely new, um, which is also really important that you don't remodel the whole model during simulation. You want to um, just do an improvement and not like change the whole part. Um, but to transfer this simulation, you would use, uh, again, the original model, so, um, so the skin, um, wrap it to, the, to this fat simulation and um, use this thing as a blend shape target um, on the animation cache and um, paint the target um, accordingly, so like you see on the, um, 
on the corner white, um, you would uh, paint the uh, head and the feet black, so it uses the uh, um, animation cache, and the rest, the white one, um, is from the simulation itself. Um, animation, uh, simula master simulation uh, brings you quite far, but it's not perfect, and it's also quite hard to um, sometimes get certain shapes. So we also did, um, as a last step, um, shot sculpting. So it's basically we are going to, um, to the frame, sculpt it right, and then animate the blend shape in. Um, you can see that it's sometimes quite drastically. Um, this was mainly because it was so late in the production that we couldn't really go back to rigging and where it should be. So, for example, the um, thing on the left where we also changed a lot on the face. It should originally or should be in, in the rigging part, but it was so late it wouldn't make sense to, to um, go back to the rig, chain it there, and go to animation again. So we did everything in shot sculpting. And in the end, um, you got this creature um, with the wig. Here you can see like a little breakdown of, of all the passes, um, like the skeleton. And with all the muscles. This is a uh, skin cluster, I think. No, it's not It's another simulation, yeah. There's yeah, a whole wig also the wireframe. Um, you can see that there's a lot of less movement in the skin, it's less believable. Um, the mass simulation helps a lot to, to give that feeling of weight, um, of, of, a, of a living flesh. Um, and this was especially the goal to make, to sell this creature more. Yeah. Right. Uh, enough about muscles. <laughs> Let's talk shots, uh, especially in shot ingest. Uh, first, what we did is neutralize all the braids. So what we brought them together a little bit color-wise. So we later had an easier job in lighting. And uh, we built some neutralized grades or inverse neutralized grades uh, as a locker table for this ones to feed our later own OCIO config. If we go, yeah. Um, which was the first straw for us, so there was a lot of color math, madness and everything. But uh, still don't know if it's the right way to go, but uh, this is what we did. Uh, so we implemented everything, we went into ACES, we had this inverse load, so every artist in every software could view the plate in every state it's supposed to be. We as well ingested the pre-grade our uh, DOP gave us and were able to give some special wishes, for example, to our texturing artists here and we uh, used our environment variables to drive everything. For our match move process then later on, we had a little gimmick, sadly we don't have it with us, but uh, we had a little tracking cube for that because we had a lot of uh, depth, high unsharp shots basically and uh, we weren't that sure which lenses our DOP would use. So we went ahead and attached a GoPro to every uh, to our shot camera or every shot camera and uh, it recorded the scene with us and later on we would uh, shoot this plate with our tracking cube as well. So later in post we could triangulate the position of our GoPro camera and our, um, and our shot camera and then take the tracking data of our, uh, of our GoPro and apply it to the shot camera. So basically the GoPro tracks the shot but the shot camera films it. And yeah, for our on-moving matte painting shots, we had a lot of on-set reference and a lot of on-set photography. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. There was tens of thousands of pictures we took from set because it was a beautiful landscape as well and it's fun. And um, so we had a pretty easy job afterwards just tracking the uh, shots and had our briefing from our director. We just painted in because we wanted to tell the story of the two girls walking towards a mountain range, but sadly there was no mountain range in the desert. So we just uh, photo bashed some in, something in there and with a little bit of comp magic had the final shot. Moving on to our matte painting shot of the city, we only had the shot of um, we only had a, um, a shoot inside the desert, but we traveled a lot around in Jordan and uh, just went there with our cameras and shot some reference. Again, on-set photography, our biggest friend here for uh, matte paintings, and then we were good to go. Later um, in 
post, we received a briefing of our director because they wanted to tell another establishing shot. So we had a little concept phase resulting in the concept on the right here of the two girls uh, walking inside a big valley. And after that, again, on-set photography, just some photo bashes and uh, no 3D use here. And we had this uh, displayed, luckily, of the two girls walking and just left it in there and it worked pretty well. For yeah, talking look dev uh, of our creature, uh, for a 10 shot, it was pretty straightforward. We just matched the onset lighting with HGRIs and chrome balls and everything. And after two iterations, we were happy with the results. And then moving on all everything into comp, after painting out our <laughs> amazing creature actor till here, um, we just slapped the uh, creature in there adjusted the values and what was pretty cool here is we got to actually keep the original shadow of the uh, curtain of our creature actor. We just stabilized the curtain a bit, returned it accordingly to the animation of the creature and then it was good to go. For our valley, the shot looked at was a little bit different because um, it wasn't a dark environment, it was a bright environment and a really flat environment. And predators tend to blend with their backgrounds a lot. So uh, how to make a creature look cool if it needs to blend within a flat environment. But we ended up using a lot of light wedges, experimenting with the creature, if we move on to the next slide, um, and trying to find out what shapes of light could look cool with our creature. And we ended up in the next slide's uh, shots where there was still a fine balance between the creature looking way too contrasty or way too flat in those shots. As well, we experimented with a lot of values, so we had kind of funny approaches uh, with really dark values to make it really contrasty and really visible in its environment, but we ended up with a little more natural look. But after all that experimenting was done, we really got into the high detail stuff and really having really fun with it. I guess you can tell the difference, right? It's just some stomach values that are different, so we experiment with the bounce light of the, of the sand, resulting in the next slide's shots. And to give you just one last example of one of the shots we had, just on the left, matched onset lighting and then experimenting with this lighting to give it a little more shape and interesting and resulting on the final comp on the right. But after we had a view of all our shots, um, we experimented a little and said like, yeah, we need some more detail or we want more detail in our shots. So uh, <laughs> our producer Marlin offered herself for a hair shoot. She's here right now. <laughs> and uh, just to get a little more detail in the next slide, we can see the creature attacking one uh, of our main actresses and it helped a lot just to get a little more detail in the hair. For our last gimmick, uh, we had another attitude regarding slime, and for that we 3D printed the skull of our uh, creature itself. We have it here. <laughs> and experimented with a lot of industrial slime. It was a lot of fun, it was messy as hell, but uh, what we ended up is screening some of the plates on top to give the mouth area a little more realism and warping it towards our awesome already there drool simulation. So, um, after we were done with the shot production, after delivery, uh, for us the project was not over because we knew we wanted to apply it uh, to the VS Award and we had to do a befores and afters, the breakdown you saw at the beginning and we, we knew we didn't just want to do a breakdown, how you know, with wipes, we wanted to do an, an own little film, a film by its own. Um, so we we said, okay, what what can we do? And uh, Lucas came up with some ideas and uh, created a first animatic. But we couldn't really plan how we would move on, which is something in VFX you usually want to plan everything ahead before you start doing it. So we did it the other way around, and that ended up that the timeline looked like this. We didn't know when what would happen, so we had like just some random deadlines. Um, um, so we could say, okay, we, ha we might fix the camera here, we might uh, start a first render there, but um, yeah, we didn't uh, finish the breakdown in, in the beginning of uh, uh, October. But um, 
it helped us to uh, get going and we just iterated over the versions and so here to the left you see the first animatic the first version of the breakdown if you will so and then there's a version from the middle of the process you see it evolved some ideas stayed the same some ideas um evolved some ideas were completely new in it and um yeah it eventually we ended up in time uh, for the deadline for the vs application um with the final breakdown so we applied uh, we then got nominated um flew to la and ended up on stage actually winning this thing which was a crazy experience so at this point we want to say thank you to autodesk again um it was a really 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 great experience um and it wouldn't have been possible without all of the people who worked on it. Uh, so main production and of course Animationsinstitut, they made a lot happen. Thank you again. Also, we want to say thank you to our IT at Animationsinstitut. Viet is here. Thank you very much. You are awesome. Um, <coughs> if you have a problem, you can just go there and they make everything possible. So that's really, really great. Um, and with this in mind, uh, we, uh, we want to watch the breakdown one last time. Uh, it's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. <laughs> it's it's pretty easy. We had a lot of story ideas at the beginning, and Alora was just uh, an, the name of the girl at the beginning, and it stick till the end. So, yeah. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Um, I have a question about the uh, saliva system that you that you showed. So um, when you three three printed the jaw and uh, shot some saliva, did you actually shoot plates and use this in compositing, or was this just as a reference for a digital fluid, fluid simulation? We actually had the drill simulation up front, but then we uh, wanted to add some some additional realism to it, so we knew upfront how all the movement's gonna be. We had a little monitor until tried to act it all out and then try to match it as far as we can go. So this was just for additional compositing later on. Makes a great asset library though. <laughs> Thank you. 
teacher first, and then you were looking for a director to, to, for, uh, for the story. Uh, how was it like? Yeah, actually not. It was like Ehrliche Wurst in 2018. <laughs> I don't know if someone knows it, but a lot of knows Ehrliche Wurst. Yeah, it was like <laughs> <laughs> it, it was kind of a random meetup in I, I just remember it started like I was meeting Murat and just because Quirin was intending to like get us together because uh, he knew we, are, we had same interests and also Till was uh, right there at the beginning and it came up like we had same interests like space creature and uh, from there it all started to do something in this direction so yeah so a lot of interests from all of us so yeah coming together So uh, I think we wanted to focus a little bit more on the technical and creature part also. And when we like meet with Murat, he's like the genius behind the story. So <laughs> he was yeah. really doing a great job. Yeah, and what what I wanted to say like before, it's it's kind of if you're doing a creature, you can it's it's uh, yeah you can do it, but. At the end, you want to like make decisions out of something. So in a story, it's way more easier to make different decisions. Why is it like this? So this we want to wanted to have something like this, not like just having a big creature smashing everything. We want to have like a kind of creature which is acting in a story because you want to watch it like in with a reason, not just this this technical part. If you could go back to when you started this whole process, what advice would you give yourself? Short piece of advice each. <laughs> Don't get lost in the details. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, tell 3D to rush a little earlier. <laughs> so we got a little more time and calm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I was still pretty happy that we didn't do even more shots. So we were not we'd be capable to do even more, but and ended up with this qual kind of quality. So it was always quality before quantity. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, as Theo already mentioned, yeah, that don't go too mental with the details. Uh, <laughs> I remember that I like bought anatomy books and went over every single muscle and just looked at it, how the tendons are, and I really went crazy with it. Um, in the end, it wasn't really the best to do it that detailed um, because it actually made a lot of things harder. So I stepped back and a little bit reduced it. Um, but yeah, this was, I think, uh, one of the things. I would say like focusing on communication is like the most important part. Uh, just yeah so everything ev everyone is like knowing everything so uh, I think yeah this is the the main thing I would tell myself and I would say always expect to have a lot more work than you would expect that you have and that it, you will always have a lot of more work after you think you're done um, I mean it's really cool uh, that we're sitting here, but we wouldn't think that we would still be with this project this intense right now. And so it's always, I mean, it's it's really cool that this uh, turned out like this. Um, but yeah, I at the beginning expected, okay, we have delivery, then we do a breakdown, and then maybe a festival here, a festival there, and that's it. And yeah, good things happen. And they t they also take time. <laughs> <laughs> so now, having done this huge project and quite successfully, um, could you tell us some, from your perspective, how working at the Animation Institute, you know, the, the curriculum side, the, the software side, the hardware side, everything. <laughs> so I would like to know how is it like from your perspective because we, we, we do get a glimpse into it now and then, of course, 
but you know, like after such a big thing, it would be nice to have a sort of a resume, a sort of a roundup of your experiences of all these aspects. Um, I would quickly start with the time aspect again, um, because we have something we call the ACA factor, which is uh, the the uh, the multiplicator you you need to calculate in that it takes longer to do a project at Animationsinstitut uh, than anywhere else, um, because there's like lessons, um, then people are sick. Well, people get sick in the real world as well, um, but. <laughs> I would just not say it archa in study environment like yes yes London. yes no it's it's not an animation institute thing and then there's like you you go drinking in the evening and don't work the next day <laughs> and that happens <laughs> um so yeah it, it for us we we uh, we 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 looked at it and said well we, if if we say we we needed one week we uh, multiply it by 3 <laughs> and that's a good buffer that w you would actually need in the end so that's that's a thing yeah, and about feedback of Animation Institute, uh, we got a lot of uh, support and anything. So from I, uh, from our side, it all like worked out very good, and we we're really happy to to had the chance to uh, to realize such a project. So uh, we were we were quite happy. Yeah, and we could three D print stuff. So <laughs> 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 at the IT, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> I would say two things. Um, one thing, the m remote access of the PCs. So we have like always access to our PCs or, or workstations, which is uh, really great. So you can just check renders, simulations every time and any time. Um, and also the mentorings. Um, so I think every department had like some sort of mentorings from the industry. Um, myself, I had um, like the head of rigging from Unstored Mauro, and he helped me like a lot of, um, gave me a lot of tips and. Um, I think this improved not only my department but also other departments and to push our, our limits and um, yeah, this was I think only possible here at Animation Institute. <laughs> yeah, and besides the cool fact that we actually got an office with awesome software and awesome render farm and all the technical stuff Animation Institute provides us with, uh, for me the most amazing part was the people. Uh, because we actually got to sit in our office day and night every mm -hmm. time and you guys know we were there every night <laughs> and uh, now we're able I'm able to present beside one of the best friends I ever had up front here and then that's pretty cool <laughs> I would also say you know after that uh, what is what overtime means <laughs> 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 probably and then you won't do it in the job so you know that. Um, and yeah, you can 3D print stuff. <laughs> <laughs>